Heather and the worship team, one of the things that um, <clears throat> I don't think we share enough with is just how appreciative we are to those who give of their time and their talents and uh, the worship teams, all of them come up here and they volunteer. They put in a lot of time and effort and to share the gifts that the Lord has given to them. I just want to say a personal thank you to each and every one of you. So thank you very much. <clears throat> now, as uh, some of you know, and, and I appreciate the, the prayer, several weeks ago I had sinus surgery. Um, it was, by all accounts, successful. The doctor is pleased with the way in which things are going. Um, and uh, I've gone to see him on several occasions and have shared that with some. And uh, one of the things that has been a challenge for me over the last uh, three weeks with the surgery is that I've been on high-dose steroids. And uh, the steroids have a really odd effect. Um, they make me bloated. Um, they make me a bit aggressive and, and emotional, um, and I have uh, hot flashes. And so I'm thinking, <laughs> hot flashes, emotional and bloated. I'm going through menopause. Seriously, um, <laughs> take a listen. Frank just reads them. I wrote it and read it. <laughs> but on a, uh, a serious note, this morning we are going to continue our look in, uh, into Revelation. And uh, it's interesting that the Lord had laid upon my heart this idea of the revelation of hope or the hope in Revelation. And I'm not a very liturgical kind of guy. I uh, grew up in the synagogue and had enough liturgy in the synagogue. So this whole understanding of, of the you know, I knew that this was the first Sunday in Advent, but the fact that this is the hope um, candle and the first week here of hope is really interesting, and, and there are no coincidences in that. So um, I'm very excited about what the Lord is going to do here this morning. So let's pray. Father God, I do just thank you, Lord, that you are the God of hope. Father, I thank you that you've drawn each and every person here this morning and I just ask for a blessing upon them and their households. Father, I just ask for open hearts, open eyes, open ears. Father, I ask that you would fill me from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head. Father, the last several weeks have been a confusing time in my own mind. It has been a challenge. But Father, you are greater. There is nothing that I have to offer this morning but we do need to hear from you. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being the one to share this morning, and I just ask, Father, that you just manifest yourself in a powerful way this morning. Let's give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Skip, can you play the video? So hope is certainly a prevalent word that we see in this society. It's been co-opted to be a political slogan, new age mantras, and the like. Bless you. <laughs> but I must ask, 
What is hope? Do you know what the Bible says that hope is? Anybody? Jesus, that's a good answer. Hope is confident expectation. It's like the old hymn, Blessed Assurance. The confident expectation, that blessed assurance of what? And in Titus 1, we read this. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promises before the beginning of time, and which now, at his appointed season, has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Our hope is based in the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's not wishful thinking, it's a confident knowing. And we need to reclaim hope. We need to rescue it from the pop culture. Hope isn't knowledge. Hope isn't an intellectual pursuit. Hope doesn't come from a greater level of understanding. It doesn't grow magically by the power of positive thinking, and it doesn't appear by sowing seeds, by doing good deeds, or is reflected in getting a better job, more money, a new car, or any worldly possession. You see, hope isn't a concept. Hope is, in fact, a person, the person of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 39, 7, we read, And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. And so you say, Jeff, what does this have to do with Revelation? Jeff, what is it? Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Well, I'm glad, Dave, that you asked that very important question this morning. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the one to whom we find our hope. Revelation is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is hope. Revelation, therefore, is the most hope-filled book in the Bible. And yet we find ourselves, I find myself, challenged. Why do sometimes as we're going through Revelation do I not feel and experience hope? Instead, I find myself anxious or fearful, sometimes confused. It's a question that I often ask myself. And I believe that the answer is that we question who Jesus Christ really is. I've heard it said that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. Excuse me. Steroids also make my mouth dry. So the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we see this vengeful God this God who rains fire down from heaven and destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. In this New Testament, we see this new God embodied in the person of Jesus Christ, and we see him as the loving and kind God, the all-accepting, all-forgiving, the friendly God, the fun, hang out, take a walk, non-judgmental God. And then we enter into Revelation, and we seem to see a return to the Old Testament vengeful God. He seems angry, perhaps even callous. A God who is heaping punishment on the earth, like that we saw in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it doesn't compute, it doesn't work for us. We want to see Jesus as we want to see him, and therefore we fight against the picture of Jesus that we don't like. I get it, I do it too. I don't like seeing a Jesus who is uh, wanting us to have bigger cars, bigger houses, and even bigger bank accounts. I bristle against this idea of Jesus being this God of grace and using grace as an excuse to engage within sin instead of the power to overcome it. So I have this expectation, this picture of Jesus myself. You know, it's interesting, my, uh, my son Noah this year is a uh, sixth grader at LaSalle. Now, uh, he had spent all his prior years Christian school and he needed some structure and LaSalle being a military Catholic school, we thought it was good structure and it is. 
And I knew that there was going to be some challenges, and, and those of you who, who grew up in the Catholic Church will understand there's some doctrinal differences, and I felt this was a really important and, and in fact, op great opportunity for Noah to grow in his faith. Noah had given his life to the Lord the summer he was baptized, and uh, he really was standing in the Word of God. And so we talked about Mariology, and we talked about the saints, and we talked about some things that he would experience, and that he needed to be a man of the word. And uh, he has gone back on many occasions and asked teachers, can you show me where that is in the word and the like? Well, they do religion five days a week, and uh, his religion teacher spent the better part of the first six weeks of school convincing the kids that the Bible wasn't true. Going so far as to ask a question on one of the tests, Give me the four reasons why you feel comfortable that the earth was not created in six days. So Noah's response was simple. He wrote, nothing. And he put a frowny face. Because for him, there truly was nothing that could convince him that the Bible would say that the earth wasn't created in six days. So he got the question wrong, and I got myself a meeting with a teacher. What was interesting is that the perspective that the teacher had was she was seeing Jesus as she wanted to see Jesus. And see, creation wasn't something that comported to her understanding, and so therefore it must not be true. She placed the value of her understanding over the value of what the Word says about God. Now, it's interesting, I was having a conversation, and I share this because this may come up for you, but I was having a great conversation with Chris Luciano about this, and Chris shared, well, then you just need to ask one question. Give me the scientific proof, therefore, of the resurrection. If there is no scientific proof of the resurrection, and therefore you must not believe in the resurrection, and therefore, why call yourself a Christian? Our faith, therefore, is meaningless. So the word of God has import. So Noah's religion teacher had pinned her understanding of God on certain things that she had believed. Unfortunately, her belief wasn't rooted in the word of God and the challenge that I placed upon her was not received very well. But the challenge for each one of us is, do we believe what the Bible says? Our brother A.J. Crenn, who many of you recall, remember with fondness and I certainly do. The Bible says it, you do it. Right? It was, it was that simple to him. Yeah. Do we see God, do we see Jesus in the way that the Bible shows him, or do we distort the Jesus in order to make him okay for us to keep doing what we're doing? And so we come back to the book of Revelation and who does Revelation say that Jesus is? In Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, Skip, if you can put that up. 1.1? One, one. There we go. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to, to present this re revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the word of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listens to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. What caught me as I was reading that once again is that this is the testimony of Jesus Christ. When I think about sharing my testimony, does my testimony look like the rest of Revelation? This is the testimony of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 4, 1, 4 through 6, we read this. Grace and peace to you for the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. 
you see this incredible picture of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. God who was and is and is yet to come, eternal and forever. And then we see King Jesus in all his glory so powerful that even John, yes, beloved John, falls down as if he were dead before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As we enter into Revelation 2 and 3, we see the seven letters to the seven churches where Jesus asserts his divinity, his authority, his judgment, but also his incredible love calling his children to return to his side, righteous, pure, and worthy of the name of Christ. Revelation 4 and 5 bring us into the throne room of God with all of heaven worshiping him in his glory and power and might. For Jesus is the only one found worthy through his obedience, his mercy, and his grace to take back the earth, finally bringing all of creation back into submission of the creator of all. In this, we know the love of Jesus. Is this how we see Christ? Well, it certainly should be, for all through scripture, Jesus gives us 10 10 points of information, if you will, 10 things about his return. I'm going to share with these with you briefly. First thing that he says is, no one will know the day or the hour of my return. In Mark, and then again in Luke, Jesus tells us that no man knows the day or the hour, and we must always be ready. Jesus applied this truth to their lives, and this is the truth for our lives as well. Be ready. Jesus didn't know if he would return in their lifetimes, but his instructions to his disciples are the same instructions that we need to follow 2,000 years later. Get ready. Leave nothing undone. You know, I've come up here and I've shared with you, I don't know whether Jesus is coming to see me or I'm going to see him first. What does it matter? The question is, am I ready? The whole idea of us going through Revelation is this point. Jesus is saying, be ready. And we need to prepare ourselves. We'll get into that in just a minute. Jesus also said there will be signs increasing in intensity. And this is what we've been looking at that Frank has been bringing us through. The signs of the times in Matthew and again in Luke. Jesus promised there would be wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes in various places and also signs in the moon and the stars and on the earth. And then they will see the Son of Man coming, we are told, in the cloud with power and great glory. What a day that will be. Jesus instructs us, straighten up, raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Once again, Jesus is instructing us to pay attention to the signs of his return in order that we are ready. Third thing that he shares it says, pray for the strength to escape these things. And this is really an interesting point. In Luke 21, Jesus taught his followers, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. From the context here, Jesus is talking about escaping from the judgment and the wrath that will be brought upon, the, uh, upon those who have rejected Christ. Jesus instructs his disciples to pray for strength. Too many Christians believe that we are going to escape just simply by default. But Jesus told his disciples to pray for the strength to escape. And so we must pray. Fourth thing, as Jesus says, it will seem like a normal day. I found this interesting. In Luke 17, Jesus compares the, son, the day of the Son of Man to those days of Noah and Lot. In those times, people were going about their normal business, eating, drinking, doing business, marrying, all sorts of things. And in the midst of this apparent normalcy, God's judgment and wrath fell. Jesus says that this is, in fact, what it will be like when he comes be a great cosmic interruption will be like lights up from the sky from one side to the other we see in Luke 17. Fifth thing he says is I will repay everyone for what he has done. 
In the last chapter of Revelation, Jesus told his followers, he is coming and bringing his recompense to repay everyone for what he has done. Matthew 25 describes the scene when Jesus will sit on his throne and all nations will be gathered before him and be judged. All people will stand before Jesus and give account for what they did in life. And how glorious will it be that we get to stand confidently in the imputed righteousness of Christ on that day. Number six, and this is perhaps the one that is most challenging. Not everybody who expects to make it into Christ's kingdom will. Perhaps some of the most sobering words of Jesus are found in Matthew 7 where he says, not everyone who will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. What could be worse than hearing these words from Jesus? At the end, there will be many people who think that they are in because of their Christian credentials. And Jesus will say to you, I never knew you, and call them workers of lawlessness. Their repentance was in word only. They acted like followers, but didn't have a saving relationship with Christ based on faith and repentance is the foundation of their lives. Jesus said there will be many people in this terrifying condition, living their lives, thinking they were in, and in the final analysis, finding out that they were not. Seventh thing that he says about his return, there will be great persecution, and as a result of the persecution, many will fall away. Jesus promised this great persecution would break out It would cause the many to fall away in Matthew 24, 9. It's easy for followers of Christ when things are going well. When things get tough, we truly find out what we're made of. Is our faith in Christ only as strong as the comfort that we enjoy? If God's enemies come and take everything, will we cling to life or will we cling to Christ? Jesus said that many will take the easy way out. You know, I think about this, that when uh, Frank and Mike went over to, uh, to India, the thing that Frank shared and Mike shared was that everything had been, there was, there was nothing left to take away from these people. And I look at my own life and see how comfortable I am. And while I cling to comfort, while I cling to the things that I know, Well, I count them all as loss and cling to the only true thing that matters. That's a question for each one of us. Number eight, because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. Again, Jesus promised that sin would lure many away from him in Matthew 24. These are people who once loved Christ warmly and who have cooled their attentions for him. Perhaps we refer to that as backslidden. They've traded in their desire for Christ with worthless idols. Sex, money, power, other false gods have replaced the love of Christ. Their love grows cold and they lose their war against temptation to sin. Stroking the heart's fiery love for Christ must include destroying the sin that so, that can so quickly quench our fire for Christ. True Christ followers must repent often and much. The ninth thing that he shared is that we must be on guard and we must keep awake. Jesus continually told his followers to stay awake and to watch their lives and to be ready for his return. In Matthew, Jesus gave four parables to explain how we should prepare. We have the homecoming, the thief, the good and wicked servants, the 10 virgins and the talents. In each of these parables, Christ described readiness with working to complete 
the work that Christ has given us, namely fulfilling the Great Commission. Every Christian is to dil diligently use the gifts the Lord has given us to reach the world for Jesus Christ. To be awake is to be ready and willing to do Christ's will. In Gethsemane, Jesus' disciples fell asleep instead of joining him in prayer as they had asked. They weren't doing what Jesus required of them, but they slept. In the same way, many of us have fallen asleep to Christ's will. We don't seek or ask for his direction. Instead, like the disciples in the garden, we sleep. We'll hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. Awake, awake, and put on strength. It's Isaiah 51, 9. How powerful is that? Awake, awaken. This is Christ's call to each one of us. And 10th and finally, Jesus says, I am coming soon. Four times in the book of Revelation, Jesus said to the church, I am coming soon. Christians in every generation are to hold tight to the promise that Christ will return soon. So as we move towards communion, a question remains. How do I integrate this into my life? Jesus is saying, be prepared. Well, what does that mean? How do I prepare? Well, I think the answer is found here in Acts 2. Skip, you can put up Acts 2. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many mir miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. See, the answer of how to prepare is not found in guns and butter, as they say. It's not found in the doomsday preppers and all that kind of stuff. The preparation is found within our hearts. We prepare for our presence before the Lord by setting our hearts right before him. And we can't do that alone, church. It's why we consider ourselves, why we are a disciple-making church. It's why small community is so important. It's why our Antioch groups, led by the elders, are so valuable and important. Because guess what? This is not how we prepare. We don't see in Acts, we don't see anywhere in the Word of God, somebody standing before you and preaching like this. Each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. How? Because they lived life together. Because they prepared their hearts before the Lord each and every day. They shared their lives. We can't do that on a Sunday morning. This isn't the venue to do that. We can bring forth the word, right? We can bring forth a teaching. We can open up the understanding and we know that God's word does not return void. And I'm not saying there isn't value in preaching the word. There's not, of course there's value in that. For us to come and fellowship and worship together as a community of believers is phenomenal. It is a joyous, joyous occasion. But this, we walk out that door. And what we do between Sunday afternoon and next Sunday morning matters. And the only way that we are going to make it matter is if we are living life together, challenging one another in amazing and real ways. 
where we can ask the question, what does this mean? What does it mean not because I need to fill my head with knowledge, but what does it mean that the Lord is drawing out of me? We are being filled so that we can go and bring that forth. There is a world desperate for hope. And we have to live that hope. And the only way we live that hope is by living it together. We were given the way. This is the prototype church. And we see impacts around the world. This is what works. This is what's working in India. Where Pastor Samuel went from six pastors to how many is he now? 24 pastors in individual bush churches in in small villages that are opening their home and inviting people in and sharing the hope of Jesus Christ. This is what's working in China. Right? This is what's working in Africa. This is what's working in all sorts of places. Why is it working there? Because they're under persecution. They don't have the freedom to come, he, to come and gather in big ways on a Sunday morning for fear of what's going to happen to them in their buildings. You see it. You hear it. Militants coming in and burning churches, killing people. If somebody were to throw a bomb in here, how many of us would show up next Sunday? It's working because they live lives together. And the Lord is faithfully adding to their numbers. The church in China is growing exponentially. It's crazy what's happening there. It's amazing what's happening in India. Because they're not interested in their comfort. They're not interested in just gathering for the sake of gathering. They want to be used by the Lord, and they see hope transforming lives, and their hope is found in Christ in eternity. 